Father, we thank you for the time and opportunity we have to be in your house and be amongst your people, Lord God. As we come in one mind and one accord, we ask that your presence would be here, Lord God, touching, ministering to each and every need. Father, you know the needs that we stand in need of. Supply them according to your riches and glory. The testimony would be given of your goodness and your grace, Father. Now, minister by them to us spiritually, Lord God, as we come to you, Father. Draw close unto you. Draw close unto us, Lord God, and bring forth change. As we step out into the world, Lord God, they can see the life that you put inside of us this day. And prepare our hearts to receive and anoint the pastor as he brings forth your word. And Father, we'll thank you for everything that's said. In Christ Jesus' name, the church said. Amen. 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 Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Give everybody a hand clap. Look at that. Praise makes, finds, confuses the enemy. I dare you to praise God right now. Go ahead, praise Him.
bit different this time. We're going to read it in the middle. Let's just pray, and then we're going to read God's word. So get ready to sit down. We pray. We're going to sit down after we pray. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you, God, that you're alive and well on the throne. As you right now, God, to help us, Lord, to see you in a new way every time we open your word. Help us, God, to be ready and, and aware and willing to let your word mold us and shape us and change us in such a way that we, every time we encounter you, we leave differently. Lord, I ask you right now, Lord, to touch your word, anoint it. In the name of Jesus, we pray in the church. Say it. Amen. 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 You can be seated on the way down. Tell somebody the past is behind us. Amen. The future is ahead of us. Amen. God is with us. Amen. And nothing, and nothing shall be impossible. Give a little hand clap. Now, I've got this up here for you today. You better read it right here. Bring it up here. Okay, ready? So first off, uh, let's see here. There we go. We get the, I, how many, remember I said, I will let the Word of God change you every time you read it. So let's watch this now. Okay. Y'all ready? Ready. Ten signs that you're not reading your Bible enough. Y'all ready for that? Uh -oh. Ten signs. If you check yes to any one of these, you're not reading your Bible. Uh-uh. Uh -oh. number, number ten. The preacher announces the sermon is from Genesis. And you check your table of contents. <laughs> All right. Number nine. You think Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may have had a few hit songs during the 60s. Oh, boy. Amen. All right. Number eight. You open to the Gospel of Luke and a World War II savings bond falls out. <laughs> it's been a while since you opened that bottle. Number seven, your favorite Old Testament picture on this Hercules. <laughs> 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 Number six, a small family of woodchucks have taken up residence in the Psalms of your Bible. <laughs> you might need to go and get some serious Bible training. Ready? <laughs> Number five, you become frustrated because Charles and Heston isn't listening to either of the important sort of table of time. <laughs> Number four, you believe the epistles on the lives of the apostles. <laughs> Number three, you think the mind of prophets worked in the quarries. <laughs> there we go. Number two, you keep falling for it every time the pastor tells you to turn to the book of first condominiums. <laughs> I was going to say, y'all turn to the second book of Hezekiah and watch everybody start going through it. <laughs> All right. Number one. The kids keep asking too many questions about your usual bedtime story. Jonah the shepherd boy and an ark of many colors. <laughs> <laughs> if you answered yes to either one of those, we need to have a serious talk out of service for it. All right. Tonight, today is the last, believe it or not, it's the last Sunday of the doors. Amen. And then next week and the next few weeks. Next week, actually, if you got any people that's dealing with depression or anxiety, unless the Lord changes my mind, we're going to be talking about that door. That's not a door, but that part of spiritual warfare is a lot of times people's spiritual warfare has turned on them and they're fighting depression or they're fighting anxiety. So, so next week is going to be really, really special. And so uh, uh, please, if you know anybody that's dealing with something like that, don't sneak attack them in here. Say, you need to come. What are they going to talk about? I don't know, but come on. And you knew the whole time. Just tell them, say, look, here's how you say it. The pastor may be talking about something that may help you. Okay, we're talking about spiritual warfare. And, and we're talking, and you can even say we're talking about depression or we're talking about anxiety because you don't want to, you know, people think if, if you're dealing with somebody that's suicidal, if you start talking about, ask them, are you thinking about committing suicide? Don't do that because they might do it. No, if somebody's dealing with suicide, ask them, are you thinking about suicide? It does not hurt. It helps to ask them. Same way, next week, depression or anxiety, uh, that's part of spiritual warfare. Because he can keep you tied up. 
Let me get you there. Spiritual warfare, are you ready for the battle? Part 12. We're almost through the armor. Next few weeks, so we're going to be right into the armor. And after the armor, <clears throat> this is going to be wild. I know this is going to be wild to you. But I'm going to make the announcement now so you can go and start getting you some people together. We talk, often talk about the 12 steps. 12 step program. 12 step program. And we talk about being in recovery. Well, a lot of times we only put that recovery to people that have a problem with alcohol or, narc or narcotics or other abusive things. But if the truth be known, every Christian in here lives a life of recovery. I'm not talking about alcohol. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm not talking about drugs. We all live a life of recovery because there's things that we've done in our past or there's things that we still deal with now and part of it can even be depression, part of it can be anxiety or whatever it is. And so we all live in a state of recovery all the time because we've got to have Christ. If we didn't need, if we, if we, didn't need, if we were always recovering, we wouldn't need Christ. Amen? So, so, so it's going to be good, but especially if you know somebody that's dealing with other things other than just, I mean, they're dealing with stuff like alcohol or dealing with uh, or drugs. If you can get them in here, but we're going to deal with it. I don't think it's going to take 12 weeks, but we're going to deal with 12 steps. And we're going to do it in a whole different way. And hopefully, hopefully we can wind up maybe even instituting this in our church to do for people outside the church later. But this is going to be for us first. I want you all to see it. I want you to hear it. I want you all to be a part of it. Because I promise you that you'll find something in this 12 steps that's going to help you. It's going to help you a lot. And it's going to wind up making your life different. And it's going to bring positive change to your life. All right? So now, just quickly, uh, these are just a few slides I've been dealing with the whole time before these doors. Uh, occupy till I come. What does occupy mean? It does not mean to take up space. It means to take a stance, to be productive, to take back lost ground. And know this, again, real quickly, the Bible tells us to be strong. Uh, in the Lord, the power of his might. Be strong now. Be constant now. Strong. Infused with inner, inner ability in the Lord. Uh, that's the only one place you can find this. In his power, his overwhelming, irresistible uh, power and might, his strong arm. And so, again, now this, is, this will be the last Sunday that you get to see the devil's door. So y'all going to take a good look at it, okay? <laughs> All right. Jesus... Uh, at the Last Supper, there was 14 present, Jesus, his apostles, and Satan. And they're all there. Satan's trying to find a way to get to Jesus, but no matter how, try, how hard he tried to find a door in Jesus' life to get to him, Jesus would not allow it. So he found none. Jesus was perfect in all of his ways. But he did. He did find how he could get to him, and let's get to the ones that were closest to him, and that was the apostles. And so these apostles, they're, 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 they're having dispute amongst themselves. They're having dispute uh, within themselves. Who's the greatest? Who's going to be doing what? Uh, uh, sending, James and John sending their mama to ask Jesus if they could be on the right hand and on the left. Can you imagine sending your mama to Jesus to ask if you can be at his right hand? Wow. You're talking about mature men, okay? So there's a lot going on. These guys were very immature at the time, all right? And so, so... These guys produced doors, and one of the doors was with, in Judas's life, and he's the one that Satan used to get Jesus arrested. So here's the doors that we've been talking about for five weeks. The first door was fear. The second door was pride. The third door was really unforgiveness. The fourth door was word deficit. And for the last three weeks, we've been talking about the lack of stewardship. Lack of stewardship. And now, again, when I talk about stewardship... It, you know, people, people get it all mixed up and think that all I'm talking about uh, is money. And it's not all money. It is, it is a total lifestyle. And what I see in this world today, and why Satan is winning so hard and fighting so hard, is because I see a stewardship drought. A stewardship drought in this world. And because we have a stewardship drought in this world, Satan is having a heyday. So, today we're going to talk about, here's the final one. We, we, we did, that, I'll tell you about it in just a second, but we talked about the attitude and the blessings, ABCs, uh, of stewardship. is growing, serving, and giving. 
Uh, the ABCs of stewardship today is going to be commitment from Haggai chapter 1. Haggai is the second shortest book in the Old Testament, but it has one of the greatest messages that will help in this last day in this stewardship drought that we are experiencing. So now, of course, stewardship is using God-given abilities to manage God-given resources to accomplish God-given results. Now, that sounds pretty simple, but for some reason it doesn't seem to be. And so here, here's the areas, five areas. It's our time, stewardship of our time, stewardship of our talent, stewardship of our treasure, truth, uh, uh, stewardship of our testimony, and stewardship of the temple, taking care of God's house. We have to acknowledge these things. And then we're not only acknowledge them, but have a good attitude about this. And then do something about it. Amen. Don't talk me to death. You know, if I'm, if I'm out there in that water and I'm drowning and you know how to swim. And you're going to try to talk me through how to swim back. Jump in and help me. Amen. Jump in. Okay. Don't talk me to death. All right. So here we go. I see a lot of people in the world today, they're drowning. Spiritually. And so that's why I've been doing, doing spiritual warfare. This one here is going to be, going to, going to, going to possibly even, maybe even be a little ouchy. But it's okay because ouchy works. It helps because I'm not going to see you out there drowning and just try to give you swimming instructions from the shore. Amen. I live this too every day. So, so here we go. Hey, guy. Can you imagine God's house looking like that? Can you even picture it? These guys have been in captivity. The Babylonians have come along and they've ruined God's house. They've been back. And while they're getting all their mess together, that's God's house. Wow. Hey, guy. Well, last two weeks, we'll go here. Last two weeks, we talked about the attitude of worship or stewardship. The blessings of stewardship. So now today, we're going to talk about the commitment of stewardship. The commitment. Y'all say commitment. All right. Now, again, this is the shortest, second shortest book in the Old Testament. But it communicates one message. Just one. And that's put God first. Simple. Put God first. The most powerful thing about this is this book comes with some very powerful illustrations. And these powerful illustrations paint a picture to help you understand <coughs> and to see what God is talking about. Matter of fact, when you talk about what I'm getting ready to talk about, the commitment, the stewardship, this is not some magic formula that you would get to hear on television, especially if you turn to some of these TV preachers. It is not a pay for a miracle. Nope. It is a lifestyle that reflects the heart of our God. It is a lifestyle that only reflects the heart of our God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But it reflects not just to Him, but it reflects it to the world. The Bible says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world, did He what? Gave. What was that? Gave. gave. Okay. So God so loved the world that He gave. He did, look, what did He give? He just gave a get by. Did he just sugarcoat it? Did he make it simple? No. He loved the world, so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. He gave the best. And he made it a priority, his only begotten son. Not the second or third or fourth or fifth. The very first one. The only begotten son. So he made it a priority, and he made our salvation a priority. And because he did, 
when we, and he looked, his priority is to take care of us. And so when we take care of him and his house and others with our stewardship, we are a reflection. Think about it. We are a reflection of the heart of God. Wow. That's so powerful. Man, is that powerful. So now, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to Him must what? Believe, believe that He is. That He exists. And that He is a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. So we're going to talk about, listen, we're going to talk about commitment and stewardship today. Let's, let's do it pretty easy. Kiss. Kiss. I'm not talking about the band. Kiss. Keep it simple, saint. Yeah, keep it simple, saint. Let's do this. Okay, keep. I. Keep the importance, keep the importance or the influence of stewardship simple. Keep the importance and the influence of stewardship simple. But one of the greatest ways to discover, one of the greatest ways to develop our stewardship and our faith, or our faith is through our stewardship. I hear people talking a lot about what they're going to do. Well, I'm going to, and I'm going to, and when I get like this, I'm going to, and when I get that, I'm going to. I like what Brandon says all the time. What does he say, Brandon? Your mouth can tell you anything. Your mouth can say anything. I love it. The mouth can say anything. Talk is cheap. I learned a long time ago as a pastor not to take much stock in talk. I remember one time I was at one of my guys, my first church, or second church, second church, I was in Bath, and I'd gone in into the garage, and uh, I'd go in the garage sometimes and help this guy do, do, handle electrical problems while he was handling mechanical problems, and I was in there doing some electrical work. And in walks this guy, and, and my member introduces me as the pastor. He goes, oh, hey, pastor, I'm glad you're here. You're just the man I want to see. I said, really? He said, I've been looking for you. And I'm thinking, well, you know where the church is at. I've been looking for you. I got something for you in the church. I said, okay, what you got? He said, I got a check for $10,000. He said, when do you want it? How do you want it? I said, that's totally up to you. He said, well, I'll see you in a couple of days with that check for $10,000. And there's more where that came from. I weren't going, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been pastor long enough now. And when he walked out, my member looked at me and said, he promised you a check for $10,000, didn't he? I said, how do you know? He says, he promises every preacher who comes in here a check for $10,000. He says he comes in here every time they let him out and change his medicine. <laughs> Talk is cheap. Cheap. Your mouth can say anything. God says, let me see your stewardship in your time, your talent, your treasure your testimony in the temple. That's what I want to see. And so, again, I want my life to be a reflection of my Father, who is the greatest steward of all time. He loved me so much that he put his money where his mouth is. He sent his son when I weren't even asking for his son. 
Now, now we're going to read. We're going to read. Just right here, we're getting ready to read. So y'all can sit down. Y'all ain't even got to get up. Now, now, this is a different kind of, this is a different version, but you can get your Bible out and look at it if you want to, too. But if you don't, you can just look up here. I'm going to read a few verses to you. Matter of fact, I'm going to go ahead and get my Bible out just in case. Y'all know where, y'all turn to the book of Haggai. I got Second Chronicles, not Second Chronicles. Lord have mercy. Trying to work too much all at one time is not Chronicles, it is Haggai. Haggai, y'all turn to the book of Haggai. Just so you can have it. Okay. No, got hey guy, if you got a Bible like mine, it's on page fourteen forty three. Hey guy, I'm gonna read the first two or three verses from the book, and then I'm gonna read the rest of them from up here. So, so, because uh, I wanted to put all of them up there, and I, again, sometimes things get moving so fast at the house, and things get moving so fast on the phone and whatever. I'm writing and doing things. I have to stop in the middle of it and go do something and come back and get something to stop in the middle of it. So, praise God, there it is. Ready? Hey, God. Chapter 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord unto Haggai the prophet and the Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the son of Joshadek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, The people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Now I'm going to meddle a little bit. How many times have you known that we needed something? Maybe physical, financial, a skill, whatever. And somebody mentions it to you, you know, we really could use that help. We really could, really, it would really be something. You go, when, when the time comes. When I get time, I'll, I'll take care of it. And again, I've been in this long enough to know that saying is, I don't feel like it right now. And if I ever do feel like it, okay. That's what the people were saying. We're out of captivity. We come back to a house of God that was ruined. We're too busy doing our thing to do his thing. Y'all say that with me. They were too busy doing their thing versus his thing. Now let me ask you a question. Do you ever get so busy doing your thing that you forget to do his thing? Mm. Wow. That's a powerful thought. Sometimes it punches me in the gut. When I ask myself, God, have I put my thing ahead of your thing? And sometimes I have to reluctantly say, yes, I have, God. And help me not have to answer that question, yes, again. So then we're going to verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came unto Haggai the prophet, saying, it is, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses? And this temple to lie in ruins. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Get ready. You have so much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages and put it in a bag, with holes. Thus saith Lord of hosts, consider your way. Wow. Now 
go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You look for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is in ruins. While every one of you run to his own house, therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I called for a drought in the land and the mountains on the grain and in the new wine and the oil and whatsoever the ground brings forth of men and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. Whoa! That gut punches me. You know me, I don't preach on money all the time. You very seldom hear me talk about money. I, I don't talk about this stuff, but we're in spiritual warfare. We're in the last days. And the Lord pricked my heart to go here. And so here's one you hear every now and then. This is one of them. Just gut punches me. It makes me want to check up on myself. And check up and say, am I really, am I really doing all I can for him? Or am I just crossing the, crossing the checks in the box? And maybe I won't cross this check or check this box this time. I'm not going to check that box next time. I'll get that later when I feel more like it. Are you saying, God, help me put you first? Because you tell me if I put you first, I will never be last. So, of course, we're blessed to be a blessing. We talked a little about this last week. I'm just going to do a few things about that partnership. We are partners with God. But the partnership, remember, God gives to us, and we give back to Him. We give back to Him through the church. We give back to Him by helping others. So through the church is directly, through helping others is indirectly, but we're still helping. We're still giving back to God. And when we do, it's a circle. So until we give back from being a container to a conduit, a container just catches, catches, catches. And God says, I don't need you to be a container. I need you to be a conduit. I want to bless you so you can bless others. I want to bless you so you can bless others. Bless you so you can bless others. So now, nothing has more impact on a person than to be a blessing. When you bless somebody else, number one, you get blessed in more ways than you ever could imagine. But also, the person that you help, they get a blessing. Giving is the highest level of living that we can achieve. I remember back in the day, way on back in the day, I was at, a, I was at a, some kind of camp meeting or something, and the, and the preacher up there was getting all fired up about <laughs> stewardship and giving to God, and he said, the devil came to get that child of God. He tried to get him, get his thoughts, but he couldn't get his thoughts because he had on the helmet the salvation. He tried to attack his heart. He said, but he couldn't because he had the breastplate of righteousness. He tried to take his legs out from under him, but he couldn't because his legs were shot in the, in the preparation of the gospel of peace. The sheaves and the legs said he didn't know how in the world to attack this Christian. And get him. And then it hit. He went around behind him and shot him in the wallet. And killed him graveyard dead. Wow. Wow. It's not what you have that makes the difference. It's what you do with what you have. So, 
We're stewards of God's grace. Whether it be your time, your talent, your treasure, your testimony, the temple. We are all talents to all of these. Or we're stewardships to all of these things. So when the partnership is complete, how do we give back? Here's all I was talking about. We give back to God real quickly. Directly by bringing tithe and offer to the storehouse, we use our time, our talent, our treasures, our testimony to bless his house. Indirectly by giving to others, use our time, our talent, our testimony, our treasures to bless others. And the partnership of steward or stewardship that God calls us to. Once we bless others, wow. People see God's reflection through you. And it's very powerful. God gives, whether it be whatever, time, talent, treasure, whatever, He gives it to us for us to give it back to Him. The commitment of stewardship. Hey, guy, is look at these people. God has rescued them from captivity. God has brought them into a place where they no longer had to serve slave masters. And now God's waiting for his turn. God wants us all in. All of us. All in. Why? Why? When you're all in, when you're sold out to stewardship, it closes doors that Satan seeks to enter. It opens doors through which God can bless us. It opens ways to which we can be a blessing. That is so powerful. That's worth the price of admission today right there. When we're all in, it closes doors right in Satan's face. It opens doors for us and for others. He says, consider. Did you know that right now, at this very moment, as I speak, Satan would do his best to distract you or deter you from anything I got to say right now. If you make your mind up today that I'm going to do better, I can promise you Satan is going to fight you all week long. He's going to make life miserable because he gets it while the fruit, while the seed is still in the ground and hasn't had a chance to grow yet. He wants to dig it up. Satan desires to start the move of God in us. That's our passion. What are you passionate about? For God. Satan wants to stop that. Satan wants to start the move of God for us. That's our possessions, our needs. God wants to take care of us. He wants to bless us. He wants to prosper us. But again, so we can be a blessing to others. And then he wants to stop the move of God through us, which is our power. And so Satan knows that if he can stop any one of those three, he's been very successful. Stewardship is not just about giving money. It's about giving everything. Whatever I am, God, you got it. You need this mouth today, you got it. You need this heart tonight, you got it. You need me to go help somebody, you got it. You need me to go sacrifice for whatever to help somebody, you got it. You need my wallet, you got it. Whatever you need from me, God, you got it because that's total stewardship. He's looking at these people that have been in captivity 
They're coming back, and they're not just building just a little old house, panel houses, these fancy places. They're trying to build up their place, and they can't seem to get going. Every time, every time they think they're going to get ahead, they get behind. And so God says, have you considered what you're doing? Wow. Have you even stopped? Instead of finding somebody to point a finger at, look in the mirror, quit looking out the window pointing fingers. Look in the mirror and say, Yeah, God, help me to think about me. What am I doing wrong? Have you even, God said, have you even thought about how you're handling this? So here's the problem. It says, My house is in ruins. He says, so now you're going to work and you put your money in bags with holes in it. Wow. You see, the people saw a physical problem. I ain't got enough. That's the physical problem. I don't have enough. It seems like everything I get just gets blown away. They see a physical problem. But God saw a spiritual problem. Wow. I, put, I, I work, I work hard, I put my money in, in, the, in my wallet, and my wallet has a hole in it. I eat, I can't get enough, nothing, nothing's working, nothing's satisfying. Man, have I got a physical problem. And God says, no, you got a spiritual problem. Why are you so busy wondering about why you got it so hard, you forgot who brought you where you're at, and you forgot who done this for you, you forgot who brought you out of captivity. And instead of worshiping me in my house, my house lies in ruins. Are you busy trying to figure out why things aren't working? They saw a physical problem. He saw a spiritual problem. But they were both right. Definitely there was a physical problem. But if they could get the connection together and figure out the connection, consider, he said, okay, have you thought about what you're doing? Have you really thought about this? If you can connect spiritual and physical, it's amazing how so many things would start working out. Man, it would start working out. So, there it is. Hey, God, one of six, you have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink and you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages does, does it to put them in the bags or wallets with holes in it. You have so much, there it is, but you reap little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you do not have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. He who earns wages puts in bags with holes in them. Listen to me carefully. Their effort was there. Their effort was there. They were working. But God's covering was gone. Think about it. Their effort was there. They were doing their part as far as getting the job done. But because they neglected the house of God, their covering was gone. God promises us if we put Him first, He's going to put us first. That's his promise. Didn't say we would have the best of everything, but we'd have what we need when we need it. That is a promise. Doesn't mean I'm in a fight with the Joneses. The effort was there, but the covering was gone. Turn with me to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. 
Verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto him them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to one, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received five talents, and this is talking about stewardship, he that received five talents went and traded with the same, and made him other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned with him. And so he that received five talents came and brought five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said to him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou was a hard, was a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not destroyed. And I was afraid. And went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. The Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servants. Wicked and slothful. Wicked means you're doing it your own way. And slothful means you're just not going to take care of business. The wicked and slothful servant, Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not straw. Thou oughtest therefore have put my money to the exchangers, and into my coming... I should have received my own with usury. Therefore take the talent from him and give unto him which have the ten talents. For in every one that hath shall be given and he, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. That sounds crazy. And he cast down a profitable servant into outer darkness where there should be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now... That has a present contents and a future contents. The present contents is if you cannot find yourself being a proper steward for God in all those areas, you will find your life miserable. Miserable. Not to mention when you get to heaven, what God's going to say there. But here, you're going to find yourself absolutely miserable. Wow. I would hate, and I hate to think about that. But you see what? The third guy was the play it safe guy. I'm just going to play it safe. If I do nothing, then nothing's going to, I, I can't mess up. If I don't do anything, I can't mess up. If I don't say anything, I can't mess up. If I don't use my time, my talent, my treasure, if I don't take care of God's house, if I don't take care of my testimony, if I don't do anything, I just play it safe. There's physical now, spiritual now, and future rewards for all of those that played it safe. God, don't let me play it safe. Y'all that know me know I don't believe in playing it safe. My wife has told me just ten times in the last two months, I don't know why you ain't dead yet. And I said, honey, I am not going to be a play it safe guy. Consider your way. Let's read that. I like, I like the way they put it here, too. Now, therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. They were reaping nothing but absolute poverty. The Spirit of the God is saying through Haggai that we are the ones who lose out by focusing on material things, not God. Can a man rob God in the long run? We are the ones who suffer. So, again, consider your ways. The problem was 
there, there was ruin. God saw procrastination. It had been 18 years since they come back from captivity. 18 years. And they haven't started working on God's house yet. 18 years. Wow. God saved them. God brought them back. Now God needs to see his house built back. And it's been 18 years and they haven't even touched it. Wow. You ever find yourself spiritually being a procrastinator? I, I, I've been a procrastinator before. Try not to be one spiritual, but I'm definitely going to. And I might fight one day. One, one time I was going to join a procrastinator's club, but I kept putting it off. God's house was lacking. Prolonged procrastination. Listen to me carefully. Prolonged procrastination becomes apathy. Apathy. I remember telling one guy one day, I said, dude, you're just, I was trying to talk to him. He, was, he wouldn't be quiet. He wouldn't listen. I said, dude, you're just ignorant and apathetic. He says, I don't know and I don't care. Apathy. When we become apathetic to the things of God, it erodes our cup. I want you to think about that. When we become apathetic to the things of God, to the move of God, to what God's trying to tell us, what God's trying to show us, it erodes our godly covering. He said, now go for it. Do everything you want to do. But no matter how hard you try, no matter how hard, how tight they may try to hold on, everything keeps slipping away. You see, these people cannot see... see see beyond the physical problem and they want to blame God for it. Not realizing that God's not the one to blame for this. Their physical problems are directly connected to their spiritual reality. God didn't do this. Well, then tell me how to erode our covering. Ready? I'm going to give you some points here about how to erode our covering. Look, in everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown you with efforts of success. Proverbs 3, 16. So get ready. Here it goes. Eroding our covering. We erode our covering when, listen carefully, we allow less important to take over the most important. This can happen in a marriage. This can happen on your job. This can happen in anything in your life. When you that idea, the less important things overtake the most important things with your relationships, with your work, with your children, and with God. When we allow the less important to overtake the most important, we start eroding our covering. When we allow the Lord's work to take a back seat to our own personal pursuits, we start eroding our covering. When we allow other relationships to intrude upon our relationship with God, God's number one. End of story. When we work diligently for our own well-being but neglect the work of the Lord, Here's where they were eroding and said, You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow up. I blew upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because my house that is, that is waste, and you run every man into his own house. This is not necessarily the most shouting message in the world, but it definitely is a very powerful message. Consider what you're doing. The passion. They resisted God's plan. They refused to put him first for 18 years. 18 years. 
Matthew 6 and 33, the Amplified Version says, but seek or aim at and strive after, first of all, his kingdom and his righteousness, his way of doing or being right, then all these things taken together will be given you besides. Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, these people say that the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Really? 18 years, you can't even prop up some of the doors? Cause of procrastination, number one, a lack of ability. That's within. We feel like we're not able. Number two, lack of tools. Without, we feel like we don't have what we need. And number three, just a lack of interest, our attitude. Remember, stewardship is not a magic formula. It's not easy money. But it is a true godly investment. Almost through. Priority, realignment, consider your ways. Here's the solution. God gave the solution. It's so simple. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house and I will take pleasure in it and I will be glorified. Saith the Lord. How many wants God to be pleased with you? That word pleasure means to be pleased with, specifically to listen carefully, to satisfy a debt. Wow. That's powerful. How are they in debt? Well, God brought them out of captivity. You would think that somebody would show some appreciation and fix God's house. Somebody would take it on themselves. Let's get some guys up and let's start fixing this place. It wasn't happening. And I will be glorified. That means to make large, to bring glory, to testify. We're not, we're not saved through our service. But we are ser saved to serve. Serve God and to serve others. I told you I'm getting ready to close. Praise God. Y'all say praise God. <laughs> Consider your ways. Choosing God's business over ours, my way or God's way. Here's the promise in the second chapter. Yet be now strong, O Zerubbabel, saith the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, with the son of Josedek, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, saith the Lord, and work. For I am with you, saith the Lord of hosts, according to the word that I coveted with you when you came out of Egypt. So my spirit remaineth among you. Fear ye not. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come. I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, says the Lord. In the first chapter, verse 12, the people obeyed, and when they got on the same page with God, then God gave them direction. Ezra is the one that God used. Haggai, Ezra, all these guys were contemporaries. Haggai sends out the message. Ezra goes. It's Zerubbabel and Joshua that build back God's temple. Nehemiah comes and puts the wall around God's temple. Once they got their priorities straight, it's amazing how the blessings rolled. And God said, you might as well understand that you can't have anything without me anyway. It all belongs to me. Put me first and watch what I'll do. I thought that was the most awesome picture. 
be a good steward with our time, our talent, our treasure, our testimony, the temple, tabernacle, whatever you want to call it, all of us together. God's using our hands to hold up his work. Wow. It's very, very powerful. Brandon, get ready to come play something, bro. How do I shut this door? The swinging door. And that's a question I get asked a lot when I'm in the heroin unit. There's guys that's been in that heroin unit three times. And it's I've never come back, and they come back. There's guys that I've been ministering for years, and one guy actually told me he weren't coming back seven times. But on the eighth time, he definitely weren't coming back because he was going to federal prison. But that's the number one question I think I get as guys are getting out. How do I stop this revolving door? How do I shut it? But let's break it down to us. How do I stop my own revolving door? I'm in, I'm out. I'm in, I'm out. I'm in, I'm out. I'm going to do it. I'm not going to do it. I said I would, but I didn't. I, blah, 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 blah. In and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. Like Jesus talking about one son was asked to work. And he said, I got it. Another son I ain't going to do it. But when the push come to shove, the guy that said I was going to do it didn't do it. And the guy that says I weren't going to do it did it. How do I shut that revolving door in my life? And how do I bring glory and honor and pleasure and glorification to God's work? Start by thanking God. Everything I have comes from you. Everything. This is not the same things we've done the last two weeks. These are all different. These are how to shut the door. Everything I have comes from you, God. Everything. Everything. My sight, my smell, my hearing, my ability to walk. I, I was... Taking Bethany one day, and just, you know, some of y'all heard this. Bethany was really, really, really having a suit. Although we got Bethany's body fixed, her face it took us a long time 15 years. We got her face fixed from the damage that her stepdad and her dad did. We got her face rebuilt, took UNC and Greenville, and it took 15 years, but they, I finally got her all fixed up on the outside. But it never could fix her on the inside. And there was a time when she was in adolescence and she was about to drive us up the wall. And I was going to a counselor with her and honestly, when that counselor called her name and said, you don't need to come with her this time, I thought to myself, thank you, God. I got five minutes rest. So, yeah, y'all saw, saw was a little sweet Bethany. I got to saw, see Bethany all the way around. Like, y'all, your children, we look at your children and say, they're so sweet. They got to be the most perfect children. You're going, yeah, right. You ain't been with them. Bethany would make a preacher cuss. I know that. <laughs> She'd make the Pope cuss. It was bad. So, she goes back in the back. And I had a conversation with God. And I said, God, I, just, I don't understand this. It don't make sense. We did what you said. Years ago, I listened to you. We fostered her. Then we adopted her. We've been getting her fixed. She's getting all these surgeries. We're really working hard with her. Everything she needs, we provide. It doesn't matter. 
go out of the way to take care of this woman. She's your this girl. She's your child. When are you going to do something? And about that time, the door opened. And a wheelchair got pushed in and pushed right beside me. A little 12-year-old girl, maybe 10. 90% of her body was burnt. Her hands were burnt off. Off. Her arms were black. Her shoes, the tongues were pulled out of them. And they were feet were all bandaged. And what wasn't bandaged was black from burns. And you could tell she'd had many, many operations because of the scars on her face. But no hands. Her feet. Tongues pulled out. All this stuff done to her. She turns around and she looks at me and she says, How you doing, sir? I thought to myself, uh, like I'm getting ready to go eat a watermelon all at one time. Just push it in because it's, I've been so stupid, God. She goes, I hope you're having a good day. And I can't even talk. And she says, I'm having the best of times. And she said, don't worry. She said, God is so good. And I was arguing about my daughter who we were getting her face fixed. But she could walk in there. She had her hands. She had her looks. And I was arguing with God because she was causing us to flip out sometimes. And once I saw this little girl, she asked me, how am I doing and God's good? And I, honestly, I wanted to just go beat my head against the wall. One night, I'm in Walmart. DC calls me. Daniel calls me. Tamala calls me. They're texting me. They're calling me. And I'm trying to help them. I got church people calling me. I got all kinds of people. They're just calling and calling and calling. And I can't even remember what I was down to aisle for. I said, well, why am I coming down to this aisle for? This is the cereal aisle. What am I down here for? And the phone went off again. And I said, watch. God, what do you expect of me? I've only got two hands. And two, I did this right there in the cereal aisle. I've only got two hands and two feet. And while I'm saying that, around the corner came a man in a wheelchair with no hands and no feet. Blowing in a little tube to make his wheelchair. And he come walking, he come walking, he come riding that wheelchair right toward me and I heard the Holy Spirit say and what was your problem again? Everything you have comes from God. He sends the Son He allows the sun to shine on your life. He allows the rain to come. He even allows the storm. Because don't you know you can just stop it like that? That little girl that loved God so much with no, no hands. Bandaged up looking at me. Conviction hitting me like nobody's business. God could have stopped that. I don't know why he didn't. Shut the door by thanking God because everything I got comes from you. God, help me to put you first and be a good steward of your business. If you'll do this, I promise you, life will change. I was in the cancer center. Bethany was near death. 
And I said, God, this doesn't make sense. It just does not make sense. This, this girl has never done anything to anybody. It doesn't make sense to me. You've got to help me understand. And I get up and I go make me some coffee. They had a coffee. It was pre-COVID, so they had a coffee machine. And I go to start making my coffee, and this lady comes in. And I moved out of the way because she was getting some coffee. And I said, here you go. And I got her the coffee stuff. And I said, there it is. Make all you want. And she looked over at me. She said, you got somebody in here? I said, yeah, my daughter. She's 27. She said, she's got stage four melanoma, but it's not looking good. I said, you got somebody in here? She said, my son. He was a top-rated brain surgeon. Rated. And she says, it looks like God's going to take him home. And it was at that time the Lord said, trust me. Trust me. You can't figure it all out. You just do what I called you to do. Stewards. Stewards, think about what you're doing. Think about how you do it. Stewards, not just checking a box. God's going to be happy because I checked this box this week and this box. No, 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 no. God, I'm here. I'm here. You tell me what you need, and I'll make myself available. Everybody, please stand. I know this wasn't a shouting message today. And it's the last of these doors. Next week we're going to talk about depression. Some of y'all say, well, we need it because you depressed us today. No, I didn't depress you. Hopefully it'll be a help. God has so much for us. So much. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God has so much for us. God, in His infinite wisdom and grace, allowed you to be here today. Allowed all of us to be here today. I actually asked God multiple times last week, could I preach something else? And it kept coming back here, kept coming back here, kept coming back here, kept coming back here. <laughs> God has so much for us to do if we just quit checking the box and or quit saying, God, when I get time, when I get time. I don't have time, God. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. I don't have time. My, my suggestion today is make time. Make it. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're not as close to God as you know you should be, and you're ready, that's the number one thing to be a steward with. Is your soul. If you're not as close to God as you should be, will you put that hand up? Let's put that hand up. We're going to pray a prayer and then we're going to go to the stewardship part. Pray with me, Father. I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for second chances. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for all the second chances that you've given me. I ask you right now to accept me with all my flaws, all my weaknesses. 
and use me to build your kingdom. I wholeheartedly rededicate my heart and life to you this day in the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you. Next question. How many in here with every head bowed, every eye closed would say, I would really, really, really want to be come a better steward for God? Put those hands up. I want to become a better steward for God. I, I want God to be pleased with me. Get ready. Repeat after me. God, you see me. You know me better than I know myself. You know the struggles. You know the pain of the past. You know the things that I've had to overcome to be here. I ask you, God, to help me consider my ways and become a better steward of all the blessings that you've given. Help me, God, to know the number one thing of stewardship is to put God first. We thank you for this day. We thank you for this second chance again. Use us to the fullness of our ability. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. I pray. They just want to say, God's awesome. Awesome. Oh, come on. Awesome. God's got this. Glory. We're going to say the Lord's Prayer. Now, say the Lord's Prayer. Brother Benny's going to dismiss us in prayer. And look, next week, remember, if you know somebody's struggling with depression, tell them. We're going to be talking about depression, so you won't get them in here and go, oh, you just, you just wrote me in here. We don't want to have anybody tied up in here, okay? Dragging them in with chains, let them come in here, all right? Ready? Let's say the Lord's Prayer, then Brother Ben will dismiss his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Thank you.